Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is the North American pronghorn, champion of migration. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Drew McCarthy. Drew, thanks so much for being here today. It's great to see you again, and I look forward to your presentation. So let's dive in. All right. Well, thank you, Sunny. It's nice to hear your voice again. It's been a while since I've done one of these presentations. So thank you to everybody for joining me this afternoon. I'm coming to you from Titonia, Idaho, and uh, we're far at the far, uh, right up against the Tetons, but on the opposite side of the border from Wyoming. So um, a lot of snow this year. Looking out my window, the snow is almost up to the window sills, and uh, I'm having to shovel the snow away from the windows to get daylight. So I'm ready for spring to come around, and so is the animal that uh, that I'm going to talk about today. So I'll be uh, talking a little bit about the North American pronghorn, and um, I'll be talking about some of the life history, some of the migration strategies, some of the unique characteristics of this animal that really is an incredibly unique um, creature. If you look worldwide, there's very few other creatures that are similar, uh, and it's a really special animal. And it's a big part of um, why I love guiding in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself a little bit for those of you that haven't met me. Again, my name is Drew McCarthy. Uh, I've been leading trips with natural habitat since around 2016. I've been guiding since 2007. Uh, I'm originally from Alaska. I grew up in Anchorage. Uh, I studied geology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I double majored in biology up there at UAF. Uh, I was a skier on the ski team and uh, worked as a geologist for a while in Alaska, but ended up joining the Peace Corps and served for three years in Kenya as an environmental education volunteer. And uh, when I returned from Kenya, I ended up working for the Park Service as an environmental planner. Worked with the Park Service for three years, based out of Anchorage, Alaska, uh, but then ended up starting realizing I wanted to teach. I wanted to interact more with people, and at that point, I was already guiding. So I got my master's in education and um, did a little bit of classroom teaching, but I've mostly been a guide full time ever since. So I consider the the outdoors my classroom, and I really enjoy uh, sharing the areas that I guide with our natural habitat guests. So these pictures on the screen are some photos taken from um, winter trips, and I just finished up my winter Yellowstone season. Um, I really, I lead trips in Yellowstone and Grand Teton in the summer and in the winter, but I really, the winter is a really special time to, uh, to, to travel in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, there's far fewer people. Uh, the geothermal features in Yellowstone are just spectacular. The, uh, so much more vibrant in the winter months. Um, and the animals that we experience are are going through life at a, at a time of the year that's really a challenge for them, but uh, for many of those animals, they also really thrive during the winter months. So this image on the right is me actually holding a little shrew, and this shrew, uh, we were, had scopes set up and we were watching bison and wolves, and a guest pointed down, and this tiny little shrew was running in between all of our boots, and so I managed to urge it into my hand and, and show it to everybody in the group, and Really, really a, a special time to experience wildlife uh, in Yellowstone. Um, and this last winter in particular was kind of unique because a lot of the wildlife movements that we get used to seeing year after year had changed a little bit. Uh, and one of the animals that we saw a lot of uh, just north of the, the park entrance um, in Gardner, Montana, were pronghorn, a lot of pronghorn, uh, which is sort of one of the reasons I decided I want to present on pronghorn today. Uh, because we saw so many of them uh, this season. Uh, and the other reason I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about pronghorn was because recently uh, I did a vehicle shuttle for natural habitat. So we move our vehicles from our headquarters in Boulder, Colorado to various points around the country in order just to, to have our trips be guided by our expedition leaders. And in 2001, I was I was driving some vehicles from Boulder up to Jackson and I encountered a group of pronghorn in their migration that was like something I've never seen before. Now, this isn't my video. This is a video that I found that depicts a similar scene to what I saw while mired on I-80 in traffic. Um, but it really, this witnessing this, this movement of pronghorn on the open sagebrush plains of Wyoming uh, really inspired me to learn more about these animals, uh, to really understand what it is that causes them to migrate, um, what are some of the challenges they face during their migration? 
and and what are some of the ways that conservation groups are are acting to uh, improve uh, the lives of pronghorn throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? And for those of you that haven't traveled in the GYE, I want to just give a little bit of a background uh, of what the GYE is. Uh, essentially, it's an area that's about 180, um, or I'm sorry, about 23 million acres, and it, at Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton are right at the core of this greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but it's surrounded by national forest land, by private land, um, that uh, it, together is one of the most intact tempered ecosystems on earth and is a, 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 um, a paradise and a refuge for the animals that live uh, in that area. So when I talk about the GYE, that's a general area that I'm referring to uh, here in this part of the country. So uh, we're not there yet, but spring is coming soon, hopefully, <laughs> to the to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And and really, you know, I grew up in Alaska, but the, the the landscape here, since I've been living in this area since around 2015, has really started to to feel like home to me. And it's become a landscape and an environment that has become one of my favorite places on earth. And so, uh, imagine this scene here that we're looking at in the spring in a couple months: the smell of sagebrush, the sound of the meadow lark singing. Uh, it is just a, an unforgettable landscape. Um, and, you know, pronghorn are one of the, the most important uh, sagebrush obligate species, meaning that they're adapted to live and thrive in the sagebrush depth. And protecting this habitat protects both pronghorn, but also protects a lot of other animals that are dependent on, on the sagebrush. So to get to our starring, uh, starring role here, this is the North American pronghorn. What an adorable face. They truly are uh, really beautiful animals and, and frankly, pretty cute. Um, now, a lot of people call these antelope. Uh, in fact, this sort of colloquially known as the, the American antelope, uh, but they are not antelope. They're actually, in a, they're the only remaining member of their family, which is called antelope capridae. They do resemble African and Asian antelope though, and they fill a similar ecological niche to those animals uh, in Asia and in Africa um, through what we call parallel evolution. Um, this uh, taxonomic family of antelope capridae evolved about 18 million years ago in North America. And as I said, the pronghorn is the only remaining member of this particular family. Antelope capra, the genus, is actually just, it basically means antelope goat. And if you look at this animal, it does, does kind of resemble a goat. Um, and also resembles an antelope, so it's a it's a fitting name. Uh, they have, as I've said, they have no other uh, relatives in North America. Just some real basics: the the females they're called does. They weigh about 90 pounds. They live about nine years. The males are called bucks. They weigh as adults about 115 pounds, and they live around seven years. Now, um, these animals were around during the Pleistocene period. And there were 11 other antelope caprid uh, members of uh, that species that existed in North America at that time. There were three other genera of antelope capridae that existed when humans entered North America, but they're now extinct. And these animals, they lived side by side with mammoth, with mastodon, with saber-toothed cats. It really, they really are remnants and they really are um, uh, connecting us to that Pleistocene uh, period here in North America. Now, why did these animals survive when mammoth and mastodons, saber-toothed cats, and others didn't? Well, it turns out that pronghorn are uh, incredibly uh, adaptable, and that adaptation comes primarily through their great speed and their great endurance. So they have two uh, characteristics that really made them successful uh, in order to avoid some of the challenges that came uh, through the closes of the, of the ice ages. Now, these animals are migratory. That's where the endurance comes in. So as the season changes, uh, as the, the snow melts and the, the ground cover begins to green up, these animals undergo uh, hundreds of miles uh, of migration in order to find the grazing that they need. And the other thing about pronghorn is that they are creatures of habit. So they're, they're kind of like me. <laughs> uh, they follow the same migration route season after season. Uh, they teach those migration routes to their young. Uh, and so those migration routes end up being sort of historical our routes for these these the, the sort of culture if we were to say of the pronghorn 
So I want to talk a little bit about some of the other migrators here in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And I decided to call this presentation Champion of Migration because the pronghorn really is uh, the longer, longest migrating animal of, uh, of all the migration uh, animals that migrate in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. So of course, here on the far left, we have the pronghorn. To the right of that is the mule deer, uh, North American bison, and then finally the elk. So these animals all undergo some pretty impressive migrations from summer to winter. Again, those migrations are uh, motivated by the need to uh, find better graze, better browse, to find uh, safer places to have their young, uh, and to avoid uh, deep snow. So if we were to, to champion, to crown one the champion, uh, it would definitely be uh, the, the pronghorn. Now these mileages that I have listed here are migrations that have been documented within the greater Yeltsin ecosystem. So if we look at pronghorn, they have about a 200 mile uh, the longest migration ever recorded is around 200 miles within the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Mule deer, about 150 miles. Mule deer are pretty impressive, and they're a close second to pronghorn in terms of the distance of their migration. And really, when you talk about distance and migration, you're also talking about challenges that they encounter along the way. So they encounter a lot of challenges during their migration routes as well. Bison, about 100 miles. Elk, about 60 miles. And it's worth noting that bighorn sheep are also migratory. They didn't make my cut here, but they also have uh, the longest migrations that bighorn sheep travel within the GYE is about 60 miles. And finally, white-tailed deer, about 40 miles. Now, I wanna point out that the pronghorn and the GYE, they're traveling across some pretty formidable mountain ranges during their migration, which does slow them down a bit and makes their average migration distance a little bit shorter. If we talk about pronghorn in other parts of their range, say in the Great Plains, those animals can migrate up to 500 miles, 500 miles. So really, um, really impressive distances traveled by pronghorn. So the other thing I wanna talk about with pronghorn is, is their incredible speed. So um, they're notorious for their speed. Uh, they've been given the, the nickname of speed goat or sagebrush rocket. I really like sagebrush rocket. That just cracks me up. Uh, they have the ability to run up to 55 miles per hour um, second only to cheetah as the fastest land animal on earth. Now, what's some of the physiology that allows them to maintain such incredible speeds? Well, first of all, so I'm an endurance athlete. I used to ski a lot and I still ski a fair amount. Um, so everybody's impressed by people that have, you know, high tidal volumes. They can, they can bring in a lot of air and breathe out a lot of air. They can move a lot of blood, big hearts. So pronghorn antelope, they've got that perfect combination of physiologic features to give them, again, that endurance and also speed at the same time. So height, a heart, it's twice the size of a similar, um, or about twice, one and a half to twice the size of a similar size goat. And they move about one and a half as much times blood from a similar size goat. Uh, their lungs have five times the oxygen diffusion rate of me. So they have an incredible ability to offload that oxygen into their blood. They're the, the only vertebrates that have uh, an oxygen uptake that surpasses pronghorn are, would be hummingbirds and bats. And think about those animals. Hummingbirds are moving at this breakneck speed, um, hovering through their wing beats. Uh, bats are the same. So it's pretty impressive that pronghorn, you know, a, a mammal of a, a su substantial size, uh, quite a bit bigger than a hummingbird, is able to have the similar oxygen uptake. When these animals run, they run with their mouth wide open. And what allows, that allows them to bring in a huge tidal volume of air, uh, their windpipe is the size of a vacuum cleaner hose, and it has half the air resistance of other animals, other mammals that are out there living on the sagebrush step. Um, and, and this, you know, for much of their evolutionary history, these animals were pursued by a false cheetah here in North America. Now, I, I say it's a false cheetah because it actually was an animal that had a lot of the same characteristics of a cheetah that we find in Africa today, but it was actually not related, uh, except it was a felid. Uh, but these animals were also pursued by um, long-legged hyenas as well as long-legged bears. Those are animals, those are predators that have a lot more endurance than, say, a, a, a cat that hunts using uh, short bursts of speed. So that gave them the endurance. So this combination uh, this, bro this, this combination of predators drove pronghorn evolution to have both speed uh, and endurance. Currently today, they can outrun any North American animal uh, by 15 miles an hour. All right, the thing I wanna mention with pronghorn, this is, this is one of the, the characteristics that means a lot to me because 
you know, living in East Africa for three years as a Peace Corps volunteer, I spent a lot of time uh, looking at uh, the animals of, uh, of Kenya. And one animal that we had uh, around the lake where I worked were a lot of giraffe. It turns out that pronghorn are uh, a member of the giraffoid superfamily. And really, pronghorn's closest really living relatives on Earth would be uh, giraffe and okapi, which live uh, in the forests of Central Africa. And there is a strong family resemblance here, as this as this uh, picture shows. And it's really interesting to know uh, how similar they look to a copy as well. I think many of you are aware of what a giraffe is, but some of you may also know what an okapi is, and maybe you've even been lucky enough to see an okapi in your life. Uh, I actually have, but only in a zoo in Colorado Springs. There's a really great zoo that has a cool copy. But these are all giraffoids. Uh, they're all related. And one of the biggest characteristics that's common among members of the sort of some family giraffoid is that they have uh, what are called ossicones. And so the giraffe on the left has these hair covered uh, bony protuberances off the, that grow actually from the plates of the skull. Now in the case of a giraffe, they're covered in fur. On the far right, we have the okapi, same ossicones uh, as a giraffe, very closely related animal, also covered in skin and fur. The pronghorn is a little different. It has the bony core growing off the skull, but its uh, horns are covered in a, um, a keratin sheath, so almost more like your fingernail. And really, that's all hair is, is essentially the same material as your fingernails. So pronghorn have evolved sort of a horn, uh, but uh, it's a little different than the ossicones that you see on giraffe and okapi, but, but, but similar at the same time. So if we were to look at the family tree of Ardia, the Artiodactyla family, which are the even-toed ungulates and, and others, um, you see down there at the bottom circled uh, the Antilocapridae, again, pronghorn being the only remaining member of that family, uh, and the Giraffidae are pretty closely related. Uh, and what's cool to think about this is that pronghorn and giraffe, they shared a, a relative back when the continents were conjoined. When those continents drifted apart, they became separate lineages. Um, but they did share a common ancestor when the Earth's uh, continents were arranged in a very different way. So I want to talk a little bit more about the pronghorn on the pronghorn because that's what gives it its name and that's what makes it somewhat unique. Um, so uh, pronghorn are the only animal that have a branched horn and that's one of the main distinguishing characteristics of that Antilocapridae family of which they're the only member. Now, uh, each of the pronghorns is composed of a slender, laterally flattened blade of bone, and that bone grows from the frontal bones of the skull, and that those became a permanent core um, to the, the horn. But what's really crazy, unlike a bison or a bighorn sheep that retains its horns for its entire life, uh, the pronghorn actually sheds its horn annually, so you can find these horns uh, out on the landscape. Um, so uh, both the male and the female uh, have horns in pronghorn, uh, but the males um, are the only ones that have the prong. And uh, the male's horns get a lot bigger. They can get up to 20 inches. Now, that, I've never seen a pronghorn buck with uh, horns quite that long, but the females usually only about four inches. Sometimes the females don't even get the keratin sheath. They just have almost like the, a copy in that last picture. They just have a... Um, a skin covered uh, uh, horn. The horns are developed at about three years of age. And among the males, those horns are actually used in competition. So they're used as, as during the rut, during the breeding season, those horns are used as a, as a weapon. So they can inflict damage on another competing pronghorn male. Uh, the prong itself, the, the short protuberance actually kind of protects, sort of almost acts as the, the sword stop on a sword. Um, and can prevent injury, um, but they can be used to deliver some pretty pretty serious injuries to a competing pronghorn male, um, and so they can be a formidable weapon and tool for pronghorn. Uh, I want to talk about their vision. So again, one of the things that I think makes these some animals look so much like their relative, which is the giraffe, are their eyes. Uh, these animals have uh, large protruding eyes that appear to be on the sides of the head, but they're actually somewhat forward. So they have, um, they do have a little bit of binocular vision, and they have a, a good, you know, almost a full uh, 360 degrees of, of visual field. Um, but they have that advantage, unlike a bison that truly has 
uh, its eyes on either side of its head. Uh, pronghorns are just forward enough that they do have some binocular vision. They have the largest size of any North American ungulate relative to the body size. And so uh, each eyeball is about one and a half, just under one and a half inches in diameter. So they have quite large eyes. Uh, they can see, um, they can see uh, movement up to four miles away. So they're not so great at, at distinguishing stationary objects, but when an when a, when a object moves, they can differentiate that movement from quite a distance. And then finally, they've got these beautiful long black eyelashes that aside from being really quite stylish, uh, they also have a purpose, and that is to act like um, like sunglasses or sunshades. So those, just like a giraffe on the plains of, of uh, the East African uh, Rift Valley, they need to shade those eyes, uh, so they have similar long eyelashes to a giraffe for similar reasons. Pronghorn also have a, a pretty pronounced mane, which is sort of unusual. You'll see during the rut, the, the, the bucks they get, they will uh, sort of puff up their mane uh, and it, it makes them look a little bit stronger, a little bit more intimidating to a potential um, uh, competitor for mates. And those hairs on the mane are about oh, three to four inches long. So they're pretty long hairs um, on a pronghorn's mane. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of their other distinguishing characteristics. This picture really nicely shows that bright white rump patch. A lot of uh, herd animals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem have a similar bright white rump patch and they'll use it in a similar way you know they can they can when they're stressed or when they're uh, when they're threatened they can raise that tail and actually much like the the hairs on their mane the hairs on their rump will sort of stand up and that's a signal to the surrounding animals that hey uh, danger is 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 is, uh, is near so it's kind of a visual way when animals are packed together in big groups they can pass that message hey danger really quickly among each other with uh, with all those white uh, rumps. And then as they start running, they all orient the direction that the group is running. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an interesting factor there. And then uh, a couple other things about their pelage. So, um, you know, the back, their backs are kind of a reddish tan. The outsides of their legs are kind of a reddish tan. Um, uh, their chest, their belly, their inner legs, their cheeks, uh, and the patch on their rump are almost a brilliant white. Uh, and this very distinctive two stripes on the neck, that was white stripes on the neck, are very characteristic of pronghorn. Uh, their, their hooves, they have, they're artiodactyls, so they're even toed ungulates, so they have a cloven hoof, uh, they have two dew claws. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting about their hooves is um, the, their front hooves are much bigger than their back hooves, so these animals, when they're running, their forelimbs take the majority of the weight, so they have uh, somewhat larger um, hooves on their front feet. Um, the females will also use their forelimbs in aggressive defense. They'll actually fight with each other with their forelimbs. Uh, and both sexes have feet that secrete uh, an oily um, conditioner for their hooves. So there's kind of a there's kind of an outer hoof which is which is rigid like your fingernail, but then there's inner hoof which is sort of cartilaginous pad which absorbs shock. Um, and they have this sort of oily uh, hooves which help to condition those fingernails or those hooves. Um, and in general, I've never smelled this myself, but in general, apparently pronghorn have uh, kind of a distinct musky odor. So um, apparently if you catch them at the right time of year, you can, uh, you can, especially when the males are marking their territory, you can smell it from some distance. And the males will mark their territory with these pre-orbital um, pre glands. Let's see if I, can, if I can get this to work here. Right, right in this region, they have these preorbital glands, which you'll see them rubbing on sagebrush during the rut in order to mark their um, uh, their range. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of the a, a year in the life of a of a pronghorn. Um, so typically, first thing I want to say is when pronghorn migrate, the females are migrating while pregnant, and the size of these animals uh, and the size of their their young that they're carrying is is kind of notable so um so generally pronghorn have two fawns or two uh two juveniles and when they're carrying those um it's it it makes up about 15 percent of their body weight so it'd be like a 130 pound woman carrying two 10 pound babies so they're actually carrying a significant a fairly large uh fetus um one of the reasons for having two fawns is predation so predation among pronghorn um, calves or uh, fawns, I should say, is, is really quite high. Uh, they lose about 50% uh, 
uh, are killed in that first couple weeks of life uh, of a pronghorn. And so by having uh, typically two uh, juveniles, that's kind of one way of ensuring that your genes are actually going to, in fact, be passed, uh, hopefully, to uh, another generation. Um, so they do typically have uh, two. Um, and pronghorn also do practice something called synchronized calving, which is similar to some of the animals, again, in East Africa and in Central Asia. These large herds, uh, what will happen is uh, all the pregnant females will drop their calves within a couple days of each other. And this even happens with caribou in the Arctic, uh, circumpolar. And the idea is that there's so many uh, young that are born at the same time of relatively the same size that it's hard for any one predator to pick out uh, an individual uh, calf and, and narrow in on it. So that synchronized calving is, is something that pronghorn do as well. And one thing that's really unique about pronghorn is that during those first two weeks of life, uh, those um, those fawns, they they can't run. They, they really can't move much at all. And so their strategy is to just sort of curl up and to hide in the grass. And so I have um, a couple more things I want to talk about with this. Um, when those fawns are just sort of tucked into the sage, they're almost like, they're like sage snacks. Everybody wants to find these little morsels that are just bedded down in the sage. They're pretty helpless. Uh, and so the biggest predators of um, these fawns would be coyote and golden eagle. Um, and as I already said, nearly 50% of them are killed during those first two weeks. So pretty high mortality among uh, those juveniles. Uh, other predators uh, include wolves, uh, cougars, grizzly bears, but really it's the coyotes and the golden eagles that are gonna have the biggest impact on these newborns. Um, so what'll happen is during this period when they're sort of sage snacks, they're kind of bedded down in the sage, trying to be as still as possible, uh, the, the doe will come back and will uh, nurse periodically throughout the day to, to make sure that animal, uh, the juvenile, is growing as quickly as possible. And um, this happens for about two weeks. After two weeks, they are able to avoid most predators. So once they've made it the first two weeks, they're generally, they're pretty home free. So the single greatest investment uh, from an evolutionary perspective that, that a pronghorn puts toward its fawn is the sheer quantity of calories the pronghorn mothers actually convey to those, those juveniles. So uh, they're just, they are feeding them so much. Uh, they're nursing them so often. Um, and those fawns, they grow so quickly uh, that in really in only two weeks, they're able to avoid most predation. Um, and so compared to other animals the same size, the weight of the fawns at birth and their rate of growth is pretty extreme. They're, they're big when they're born and they grow rather quickly. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the coevolution that's occurred between coyotes and these pronghorn fawns. Um, there's sort of this interesting shell game that's, that's developed over the years between coyote and the, the, the mothers of pronghorn. Um, so what will happen is after nursing, the fawns, uh, the newborns will trot off and they'll find some featureless spot in the sage and they'll just lay down motionless and they'll put their chin down and they'll just stay like that for hours and hours on end. Um, so as I've already mentioned, pronghorn have a lot of scent glands in their feet, a lot of oil glands in their feet. So coyote, they can smell where the mothers go. And so the mothers will walk away. The coyote can follow where the mothers go, uh, but they can't smell the, the fawns. They're completely odorless. So when the mothers go back to the fawns, um, they, they sort of trigger the fawns to, um, to defecate and to urinate. And the, the, the female pronghorn will actually eat the feces and drink the urine in order to prevent that odor from persisting. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll have to remember the exact spot of that fawn, um, but they'll go away and they'll sort of, they'll develop this really kind of random movement pattern to throw off the coyote. So um, they won't look at their fawn, they'll, they'll uh, you know, focus their attention other places. Um, they'll sort of uh, kind of crouch away um, they'll stay close enough that if a fawn, if a coyote goes after their fawn, they can, they can defend it, but uh, they stay far enough away as to not draw attention uh, to the fawn. Um, but she's got to remember that location of that, in this huge wide open sagebrush step, she's got to remember the location of where that animal was left. It's pretty impressive. Um, so in order to throw off the coyote, she'll vary the distance that she stays from that fawn um, throughout the day, uh, and she'll vary the timing of her return uh, visits to, to nurse with the fawn. 
And so that way the coyote's never able to, to really pick up the pattern and uh, they have less, they're less apt to, to find those, um, those, uh, those fawn. Uh, and sometimes the females will even create these false, they'll, they'll sort of run off in directions to, to distract the coyotes um, purely as a, a, a ruse to, to get to distract their attention. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is after about five days, an instinctual change occurs with the fawns. They, instead of um, when, they, when the threat approaches, instead of staying perfectly steer, uh, still, they begin to, to change their strategy a little bit and they'll, um, they'll actually vocalize. They'll sort of jump, they'll make a quick little leap and they'll bleat and that causes their mother to come back and defend them. Um, so their strategy changes in, as those first couple weeks of life uh, progress. So I want to talk a little bit about now sort of the seasonal diet of a pronghorn and it changes pretty dramatically and it's a big part of the reason why pronghorn have such a long migration. Um, it's really all about food uh, and avoiding uh, the worst of the weather. So in the spring, uh, pronghorn have a diet that's primarily forbs. You can see this little um, uh, graph up here in the corner. So they're eating mostly forbs in the spring. And if you think about that's the period of year when the, the does are nursing their fawns. And so that's that period of time when they're producing such a vast amount of milk to help those animals become bigger uh, as quickly as they are. Um, not much in the way of grasses. The grasses haven't really greened up as much and they don't need to eat as much of the shrubs because the forbs are, are uh, a greater proportion of their diet. Now, as we move into summer, uh, the forbs become the primary proportion of their diet. And you know, when we're talking about forbs, we're really talking about flowering plants. So this picture of this pronghorn is probably eating maybe an aster, um, but they're eating a lot of flowers. They're eating the stems of flowers. Um, anybody that's spent any time in the GYE in the summer knows that it's actually quite a floral explosion. So there's quite a lot for them to eat. This is the time of the year when they're not eating much in the way of shrubs at all. And the primary shrub that pronghorn are eating are sagebrush. So these animals have the unique ability to eat and subsist off sagebrush as a part of their diet year round. The only other animal that really uh, eats uh, sagebrush uh, in the GYE would be uh, mule deer. And they're not eating sagebrush year round, only at certain times of the year. Then finally, during the summer, another small proportion of their diet are grasses. So they're primarily eating on uh, eating forbs. And finally, in the fall, um, that shifts a little bit. They start to eat uh, more shrubs, so more sagebrush, uh, as the quality and availability of forbs begins to decrease. And again, grasses are not a huge part of their diet uh, in the fall. And then finally, in the winter, uh, this is when they're going to be eating primarily shrubs. So this is the time of the year that they're going to be uh, eating sort of the woody stems, um, the, the hardy leaves of the sage, which actually don't wither too much in the winter. They're still available in the winter. And so during the winter, pronghorn are eating almost exclusively shrubs, very few grasses and very few forbs. So this is an interesting life history um, that gives you a sense of uh, the sort of the elevation that pronghorn are exploiting uh, and sort of what's happening during that period of their life. So if we start here on the, the left-hand side of the figure here in March, which we have just started, uh, they're going to already start migrating. So they're going to move from the lower elevations um, up into some higher elevations over April and May. Uh, in late May, that's when they're going to be dropping their fawns, the birthing, and then that period of lactation when they're feeding their, their young, that's going to be those first couple months of the summer. Note this average elevation of 7,300 feet. This is for Wyoming, uh, pronghorn in Wyoming. So we jump down here into September, Late summer, uh, we go into the rut. Uh, they're still at high elevations during the rut, um, the breeding season. And then finally, after the breeding season is done in November uh, and December, that's when they're gonna start dropping elevations. And that's when I encountered all those pronghorn while driving a NATHAB vehicle from Boulder to, uh, to Jackson. Uh, was during that period in December, it must've been right toward the end uh, of their migration. And then their winter range during December, January, February, uh, they're going to be at an average elevation of about 6,700 feet. So they're going to be quite a bit lower during those months. So uh, pronghorn are really, um, they're really unique migratory animals. So as I mentioned earlier, they, they really survived the last ice age. Um, they beat out the other megafauna primarily because of their ability to, to migrate and avoid the worst of the conditions 
Um, so they're they're pretty they're pretty adaptable, pretty plastic. Um, periods of ice, uh, greater ice extent, or periods of extreme drought, these animals would have been able to to weather better than uh, some of their their colleagues. So I want to mention that pronghorn historically ranged uh, southern Canada all the way down to Mexico. These animals would would have been out on the Baja Peninsula, and prior to European uh, Euro-American settlement of the West. They figure their population could have been 35 million animals. So I'm used to talking about the bison and bison, you know, populations that might have even been as high as 60 million. But pronghorn would have been a close second in terms of quantities, massive quantities of these uh, grazing and browsing animals um, prior to Indo-European, uh, excuse me, Euro-American settlement of the West. Um, following that period of settlement and really period, long periods of unregulated hunting, their numbers dropped to about 13,000 in 1915. That would have been about the low. Um, but like other ungulates of the West, uh, they benefited from conservation and translocation efforts that were implemented in the early 20th century, and they recovered quickly. Their populations recovered quite quickly. Um, today, pronghorn are really widely distributed through the American West. But their ranges are much smaller than historic, and they're much more isolated. And so you can imagine, from a biodiversity standpoint, you know, great, greater distribution, smaller groups, more isolated, uh, has an impact on their overall health of the population. Uh, today, uh, there's probably about 800,000 pronghorn in North America, and well over half of those animals are in the state of Wyoming. So Wyoming is about the best habitat you could imagine for uh, for pronghorn. Uh, almost entirety of the state is sagebrush steppe, uh, with the exception of the northwest corner of the state. Um, and so pronghorn are doing quite well in Wyoming, uh, although they do exist in great numbers in Montana, some in Idaho. Uh, I'll show you a range map here in a second. Uh, one thing I want to say about the migration of pronghorn is that, as I said before, they are pretty habitual. They follow traditional routes, but they also can be quite plastic in their migration, meaning that they don't always migrate every year. Some years they may choose to not migrate at all. Um, and so it can be a little confusing for land managers because they aren't very predictable. Um, but when they do migrate, they do tend to follow uh, the, the traditional routes that have been used uh, for generations. And so one of those routes I want to highlight is uh, over here on the right, this is what's called the path of the pronghorn. And this has gained a lot of press notoriety recently because, well, a couple of reasons. Um, one of the reasons, well, first let me address this figure to the left here. So you can see the, the current range is sort of the, the dark brown versus the historic range would be kind of the lighter brown. Uh, you can see that pronghorn extended well south into Mexico and the Baja Peninsula. Um, and then this image to the right, this is the corridor called the Path of the Pronghorn. So this is a, about a 120 mile corridor between uh, the Green River Basin here down to the south and Grand Teton National Park, uh, up close to where I live here, a little bit to the north. And um, so in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, there were about eight of these historic migration routes uh, that had been identified that pronghorn used in and out of the high country to the lower elevations for their winter ranges. And of those eight, only six are still active. Um, or I'm sorry, uh, of, of those eight, six have been disrupted. And so there's really only two that are active uh, of their historic migration routes. And so one of them here is this path of the pronghorn. Um, so the reason that this is so important is that, you know, in winters when there's very deep snow, any disturbances along this route could inhibit uh, pronghorn from either getting down to their winter range uh, or uh, getting back to Grand Teton National Park. Grand Teton Park being, you know, one of the country's uh, pre premier uh, national parks, uh, excellent wildlife viewing, a draw to a lot of uh, visitors from around the world to see uh, pronghorn and other animals in Grand Teton. Um, I want to say along this corridor, there is a good share of, um, of challenges. So, these animals, they're crossing some high passes in the Gravant Mountains that are almost 9,100 feet in elevation. Uh, they're crossing highways. They're going through subdivisions. They're um, going through the Pinedale Anticline gas field. So oil and gas development is a big part of the economy of Wyoming, but it's also a big impediment to some of these traditional migration corridors that, that pronghorn have used for, for so many years. Every year, uh, 300 to 400 uh, pronghorn attempt that migration route. Um, but 
or at, at a good year, 300 to 400 could attempt that migration route. But like I said, in years when there's not a lot of snow, um, some of them might not even migrate at all. They might actually even stay up uh, near the National Elk Refuge uh, or uh, in areas of Grand Teton National Park. And in the years that I have guided uh, in, in those parks and refuges, uh, there have been a few winters, probably a handful, when we've seen pronghorn spend the entire winter and skip that that dangerous migration. And it was likely due to the fact that the snow just wasn't uh, as deep. I also wanna point out this segment right here, this is federally protected. So this is national forest land. So this segment of the path of the pronghorn uh, does have some greater uh, protections afforded uh, by the federal government, by the forest service. But this segment here uh, is the segment where they're crossing oil and gas fields, highways, subdivisions, and um, and rangeland. So uh, we'll talk about some of the strategies to protect those animals as they move through uh, some of the rangelands. But first, I want to talk a little bit about how you know for a long time it really wasn't until the 1980s that that wildlife managers really understood the migration of pronghorn. Uh, you'd think such a beautiful animal would have been subject of more research, but it was um, it was I won't say neglected, but it just hadn't been hadn't been a focus for for research research until. In the 1980s, the Wyoming Department of Game and Fish uh, fitted uh, collars to the, some of the first pronghorn and were amazed at the distances they traveled. So again, they observed pronghorn traveling from Grand Teton all the way to Rock Springs, uh, Wyoming, which is even farther east and south than, um, than the Green River area. Um, in 2013, uh, biologists put radio collars on pronghorn in Southern Alberta, and they found that some of those animals were migrating up to 300 miles. Uh, which was much farther than they ever had really expected. Um, in the last decade or so, satellite imagery and um, the technology to allow satellites to track uh, using collars have really improved the ability for uh, wildlife managers to understand the migrations of these animals. And really it's helped um, land managers, including WWF, uh, help to coordinate conservation efforts between states and in some cases, well, in the case of Canada and the US, across international borders. So understanding these migration routes has really helped to uh, conserve the habitat for these animals. Um, so what are some of the impediments uh, to their migration? Um, first of all, I wanna mention that when pronghorn migrate, it, it's, not, it's not like a conveyor belt. It's not this continuous, um, let's go guys, and, and one big push, they make that 120 mile migration. They actually do it sort of in a, in a punctuated fashion. So they stay over almost, they have these stopover points where they might spend some time feeding and then they would continue on after a week or so uh, of feeding on these stopover points. And so in some cases, when we look at these corridors for pronghorn migration, it may not be possible to protect the whole corridor, but understanding the movements and these stopover points can help to protect these critical sort of um, stopping points uh, and that'll that'll make it easier for them as they continue through some areas that are that are unprotected. Obviously, it would be ideal to protect the entire corridor, but that is not always necessarily possible. So, uh, focusing on protecting the stopover points um, and focusing on removing impediments to migration is is really important for these animals. Um, there's some unique things about pronghorn. Uh, you know, they they evolved on a sagebrush step where the the highest uh, sort of feature that they generally encountered would be a really tall sagebrush bush. So they aren't that really great at um, negotiating fences. And so we think pronghorn, they have this characteristic tendency to dive under fences versus uh, going over them uh, because they evolved in an area where there just weren't many obstacles that they typically had to negotiate. Now they will jump over fences as that bit of video showed that I, that I presented to you all earlier, but they, they prefer not to. Um, so I'll go a little bit more into fencing in a moment, but some other things that the state of Wyoming Department of Transportation has been doing is building uh, wildlife overpasses and underpasses. And this image really shows, you can see this, this group of pronghorn making their way up over this, this uh, highway. I believe this is near Pinedale, Wyoming. Um, and so there are a number of these uh, wildlife overpasses that have been built uh, and they're used by a variety of wildlife, not just pronghorn. Um, in order to protect them as they're making their way. Um, these were funded by the National uh, Fish and Wildlife Federation by ConocoPhillips funded some of these. So certainly the oil industry has helped to contribute some money toward these, um, these overpasses and underpasses. Uh, and then wildlife friendly fencing. I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, 
there was a study that was done recently by the Nature Conservancy looking at the impact of fences and trying to decide um, what were the best type of, of, trying to discover what were the best type of fences to have minimal impact on migrating pronghorn. Um, and so what they did is they looked at three different uh, fence configurations. Uh, all of these fences had a bottom wire that was 18 inches off the ground at a minimum. That would allow for pronghorn to go under the fences. And in one group, they had uh, a bottom 18-inch uh, wire that did not have barbs. Uh, it was smooth. Uh, in another test, they had um, that bottom uh, wire had been lashed to the middle wire, so it was held up just a little bit higher in spots. Also, it was smooth without barbs. And then the third test group had these, what were called, um, oh, what are they called them? Uh, they call them goat bars, <laughs> funny enough. They had this strip of PVC, which was supposed to uh, help the pronghorn go under the fences without it scratching their hides. You know, injuries to their hides can actually be pretty detrimental to these animals. It can cause infections. It can make them subject to hypothermia. So preventing injuries caused by that lower line of, of wire is quite important in the rangelands that uh, pronghorn are, are negotiating. Everybody thought that the goat bar would be the, the best um, a solution to these fences, but in fact, uh, the pronghorn seemed to avoid the goat bar, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, and so, either that lower uh, wire being free of barbs or being connected to the to the uh, middle wire uh, was the most effective to, um, you know, still retain cattle, still you know play the role of the fence, but allow pronghorn to move uninjured. Um, also, this study. And, and other satellite collar studies have, have you know, once uh, farmers are able to understand what these migration routes are, some of the best strategies are just to have no fencing at all or to leave gates open for a short period or to concentrate these special adapted fences to areas where pronghorn do habitually travel in order to prevent them from, from being injured. So I wanted to highlight a couple more resources or a couple resources for those of you that are interested in learning a little bit more about uh, pronghorn. Uh, the Park Service recently released this um, this volume called uh, Yellowstone Pronghorn Recovering uh, from the Brink of Extirpation. And uh, this is an excellent resource. You can get this online. Another really great book uh, about uh, migrating animals in Wyoming is this, this one on the right, Wild Migrations. It's a beautiful volume. It's got great maps. Um, so I would recommend both of those books to learn a little bit more about pronghorn and their migration in the Mountain West. And yeah, with that, I will just hand it back to Sunny and take any questions that you guys might have. Drew, thanks again. That was fascinating. Um, before we start the Q&A, I just want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, but let's go ahead and dive in. We've got some good questions um, accumulated already. Let's see here. Um, Growing up in the desert southwest, um, one of our viewers was told that the local pronghorns had evolved slightly different hooves that were adapted to sandy conditions. Have you ever heard that? I have heard that. Yeah, there's. I think there's four subspecies of pronghorn, and there's several like morphological differences between some of those desert pronghorn. And I just was reading this this morning, uh, but I don't recall what the other. It was beyond just the hooves. There was some other. I think it might have had something to do with um, the fur on their on their their rump. But um, but yes, they are they're slightly different. And this goes along with that question in a sense. It's, someone wanted to know if the isolation of groups you mentioned would affect future evolutionary characteristics. Well, I think the I think that what what I've sort of one of my biggest take homes from learning about more about these pronghorn is that is really how adaptable and flexible and plastic their behaviors really are. So on one token, and I said this really in the presentation, they are very habitual. They do follow these migration corridors, um, but they don't, they don't choose to migrate every year. Some animals might migrate as a group. Some might be more, um, more nomadic. Um, so it's a real challenge to land managers and wildlife biologists to, to to plan for these migrations. Um, so the isolated isolation of the groups is certainly a, a concern, you know, whether it would impact their um, 
you know, their future evolution would be a question probably beyond <laughs> our time frames. But um, but I think they they can keep us guessing. You know, they're pretty they're pretty adaptable animals, and I suspect more adaptable in some ways than say bison that are struggling from some of the same issues. Um, I suspect that pronghorn have a few more tools in their toolkit to uh, to avoid some of the challenges from those isolation groups. Hmm. Um, so this is kind of a, a two-parter. Um, how reluctant are pronghorns to cross roads and navigate subdivisions? And do you know if they have or have demonstrated an instinct to seek out wildlife corridors that I imagine are few and far between? Well, they definitely are really skittish animals. Um, I've noticed this just leading trips in, in Yellowstone uh, even more so than say elk or or bison, you know, they you approach with the vehicle, you know, you, you shut it off, you roll down the window, and even just the slightest conversation in the in the van, those animals start moving. Uh, they're really really uh, sensitive to disturbance, uh, and so highways, they're they're very uh, reluctant to cross highways. That video that I showed is. They don't have a choice in in many cases. They just don't have a choice. They absolutely have to cross major highways uh, and pieces of pretty uh, disruptive infrastructure to them. Um, but in order to complete their migration, they they have no choice. Um, as far as the second part of the question, would you remind me remind me the second part, Sunny? Um, just do they demonstrate that there's like an instinct to seek out wildlife corridors? Do they they have a a sense that they exist or they should be looking for those or they just kind of use them when they happen upon them i guess is the question well there's a couple things so they do actually teach their young the migration routes so it's not like a a, a lot of birds for instance uh, are born with an innate sense of the migration corridors pronghorn are not so they do learn uh they do learn the migration corridors from their parents um they also, you know, topography plays a really big role in migration corridors. So I guess that's somewhat obvious, but if there's this distinct set of uh, passes and valleys that have lower elevation stopping points and then the next pass uh, and then another low ele lower elevation stopping point, um, there's certainly gonna be a tune to the topography. Um, and I've read of pronghorn that migrated solitarily, not as a group, and used completely novel routes that hadn't been used before, but they linked to these stopover points um, in order to, to make that new corridor successful for them. So they must have some sort of an instinct to read the, read the landscape and uh, create sort of more novel migration corridors. Hmm. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Is there is any area in the Pinedale gas fields um, protected for the prolong for the pronghorn migration? Well, the so yes, protected is kind of like how do you define protected? So not in the sense of the Forest Service land where it's it's actually lands where you know gates are closed and no vehicles are allowed during the migration period. Um, you know the the Pinedale anticline those those gas fields, um, they're, you know, conservation groups are working with them so that they understand the times of the year that they want to minimize their activities. They want to keep gates open. Um, but so I would say that there is some, some recognition that, that animals are moving through and, and some efforts to assist those animals in their migration. Uh, so it is protected in a sense, but it's not protected in the, in the context of, you know, we have the power to, to, you know, keep out any human disturbances, people and vehicles. Hmm. Well, thanks again. Um, I learned a lot today and, and now I know what I'm seeing when I drive along the highway occasionally. We, we were having a discussion recently, are those antelopes? So now I have a much greater understanding. Um, I think I'll hand it back to you now for some closing comments. Sure. Well, you know, I love doing these webinars because they really give me the chance to to sort of uh, explore topics that are fascinating to me and fascinating to our guests. And you know, you really couldn't um, choose a more interesting subject, I think, than than migration. And um, you know, whether you're in East Africa or in the sagebrush steppes of the of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, 
you know, experiencing these animals, watching these animals as they undergo these migrations is is pretty inspiring uh, and really continues to drive me to, to lead trips and to um, travel the world. So I hope I hope this presentation has inspired some curiosity among all of you, and uh, maybe I'll see you on one of our, our Yellowstone trips in the winter uh, or in the summer. Sounds good. I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks.